Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Um, hi, we're just going to do a quick sound check just to make sure that the audio portion of our webinar is working. Eric, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you <laughs> now that I'm unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that helps. And everyone who's listening, uh, you should be able to hear two voices, uh, mine and Eric's. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to Madeira USA's webinar, Embroidering for Fun, Fame, or Profit, How to Turn Your Passion for Embroidery into a Profit-Bearing Business. Um, hi to everyone. My name is Alice Wolf. I'm Madeira's Manager of Education and Publications. And we're just a, a few housekeeping points um, as you uh, check your volume and make sure that your computers are, are working and you can hear us. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that the webinar will be recorded. If you're called away for any reason, you will be able to have access to this recording. Um, the PowerPoint slides, the slide deck that you see that Eric is going to take you through, um, are also in printable version. Um, at the end of the webinar are some special offers, both from Madeira USA and from Eric. Um, so we're hoping that you will stay with us for the duration. And also just a, a kind of a warning that we might run a little bit over our hour. Uh, we do, we are always try to be respectful of your time and keep our webinars just to an hour. Uh, when, when we were doing our practice, we went a little bit over. So we're going to ask you to hold your questions to the end, and then if there's time, um, Eric might be able to take some questions. Also, um, Eric very graciously has encouraged everyone, if you got here early on the first slide that you're seeing here now, there's about six different ways that you can reach out to him. And if anybody needs a little extra help, um, he would be willing to do a kind of one-on-one -on -one with you after the fact. We are so pleased to have Eric Campbell with us today as our guest speaker. Many, probably most of you already know him as an industry leader. Um, Eric has covered this topic before in print and in paid seminars, but we've never really approached it in webinar format before. So we're going to start out with a few assumptions. Uh, one is that we're speaking with embroiders, and the second is that as an embroiderer, you either love to embroider or have at least have a healthy respect for it. And finally, every once in a while, you wonder if you could ever actually make a living doing what you love. By the end of this hour, plus maybe 10 minutes, uh, you'll have the tools to determine if you are able to launch a healthy business and thrive. And with that, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Eric Campbell. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. So uh, let's go ahead and start out with some thinking points. I'm going to go ahead and preface this by saying we're not going to be getting deep into things like uh, financing and other business matters. Right now, we're going to be trying to get you to think about embroidery in a way that is more business-like and to talk about the setup that it would require to move from your passion for embroidery into a business space. And a part of what we're going to do here is start with these thinking points. First, uh, what is it that you love about embroidery? Later on, we're going to discuss what your position would be in an embroidery company. You might start. and Knowing what it is that you love about the process and what it is you love about being in embroidery will help you to decide exactly how that looks when you build your business. Uh, second, how much business sense do you bring to the table? It's okay if you don't come to this immediately knowing how to do business because there are other resources you can get into for business materials. Not to mention, you can hire in people to help you with other parts of the business that aren't the embroidery section that I'm sure you are already passionate about. Uh, third, can you afford to move slowly and test the waters? Uh, in today's gig economy, it's very common for people to talk about a side hustle, and frankly, home-based embroidery especially is one of these side hustles that I've seen work very well for people in my years of consulting. Uh, can you afford to move slowly? Do you have some capital to work with? That's something you should really be thinking about, especially if you think you're going to jump directly into a profitable business directly from your passion. That's something to watch for. You know you're going to need to have capital, and there's nothing wrong with having an overlap with other sources of income. 
Uh, fourth, do you have a niche market or interest that might be able to uh, help you concentrate your initial business? A lot of people have trouble with marketing. At the end of this webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about marketing and marketing channels and how to get into it. But really, I see tons of people who just aren't good at getting over that initial hump of what it means to sell and what it means to them to be someone who sells. Having a niche market or an interest can really help you both define your business and help it stand apart and help you get past that initial hump of what it means to sell. And last year, start with a checklist. I don't mean a specific checklist, and you won't find this in a PDF. However, if you do look at the PDF handout that I've assigned here that is there for download, there are all of the topics that I'm going to cover in more detail that I could possibly get to in this hour. Looking through that and going to some sort of business classes or a business organization to help you start a small business will let you have these things that you can check off. And what I'll say for myself, everything that I do as far as organization, even creative work, starts with writing and sometimes the best thing you can do is get these things written down including the topics we're going to talk about today write them out get things out of your head and then make a checklist to say where am i strong where am i weak and what do i need to work on if i'm going to turn my passion into a business so let's start with your success condition that's a fancy term that just means what does it look like to you when you imagine your successful business. We'll start out with the part you play. What part do you see yourself playing in the operation of your business? Uh, lots of us come to this from the passion for the creativity of embroidery. I know myself, I was a digitizer to start, and actually I was an operator before that, but what I really became passionate about was digitizing and design. Uh, later on, I became pretty skilled at e-commerce and had started and ran several large stores. However, I really love the creative part of the business. There's absolutely nothing wrong after you go through a period likely of either being a sole proprietor where you do everything and wear all the hats, there's nothing wrong with coming through and hiring in someone who's good at marketing or business or management. Though you should know what's going on in your business, there's nothing wrong for hiring to your weaknesses, which we'll talk about again later. So imagine the part you play in your business and think about what that looks like to you. Second, what kind of business do you imagine working in? Uh, there is no reason that you have to have the same kind of business that everybody else has. If you look at the image on your left, that's a big customer facing showroom from a business that I worked at. That's a generic embroidery business that was mostly business to business, business to teams, uh, sports, schools, things like that, and it was general decoration. But I have consulted with people doing things in home decor. Uh, there's gift shops that do customization and monogramming for people while they wait in a retail space. There are all manner of different ways that you can have a successful embroidery business, and they don't have to look like any other decoration business. So definitely think about what that looks like for you. What kind of business, what kind of work do you want to be doing? And lastly, what does success look like for you and your business? Uh, when I've spoken to a lot of business owners, there's sometimes a derisive feeling when you talk to them about people who decide to stay small. They say, okay, well, these cottage industry embroiderers are just trying to provide themselves a paycheck. The truth of the matter is there's nothing wrong with that, especially when we're talking about the idea of the side hustle, the gig that's overlapped with something else, there's nothing wrong with you working to eventually replace a paycheck with something you really want to do. So absolutely, there's nothing wrong with your success condition being small. I know several shops, some that have been running for a couple of decades, where they literally have two machines working in a home-based space, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that being your success condition. However, if you want to work in a large production facility, that's a success condition that's good to look for too. Think about what that looks like for you, the labor you want to put in, the risk you want to put in, and how much management you want to do of a business before you start into the process. Uh, the next part, though, is a little bit of a reality check. Being in business. Uh, no matter how much you love the creative part of this work, you have to do business to be in business. If you don't want to sell, if you don't want to market, you don't want to do taxes or have to deal with the inflow of garments, the outflow of jobs and working with your capital, you're going to have a hard time doing business work. If that absolutely has no interest to you, I have had several people where upon discussing the business propositions, they decided to work in someone else's company for embroidery instead of starting their own. And that's a perfectly fine choice if all you wanna do is the embroidery side. However, as you know, point two, you can learn the basics as a proprietor, learn how to manage your business, learn how to manage all of this clerical work and employ to your weaknesses down the road. If you decide that you really want to be in the embroidery production and that is where your passion lies, there's absolutely nothing wrong with partnering either at the start or down the road with someone else who really likes to work 
on the business instead of in it. If you have somebody in your life who is a natural manager, a natural marketer, and someone who's great with numbers, and they want to join you in this adventure, there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't do that. So you do have to do business, but learn your strengths and employ to your weaknesses so that down the road you can do what it is you want to do in your business. Now, you may find, like me, that the idea of marketing that sounded weird at first becomes part of your passion in doing this business, that marketing, finding ways to give people what they need and come up with solutions becomes part of what you love. But you won't know that until you get started. Uh, the third item here is a little bit twofold. Uh, look for your tribe. This is both when you're talking about people you may want to hire and honestly, we're looking for people to sell to. There is a tribe, there is a group of people that aligns with what you want to do. Whether you're talking about your employees when they need to be aligned to the purpose that you have and the kind of business you want to run, or you're looking for your people you're selling to, you're looking for business partners, you're looking for people uh, who are your customers, they need to be your tribe to do the best work you can do. Often this means, like I said earlier, marketing, starting it with a group that you know very well, and working toward the things that they need. When you have deep knowledge of them, it helps you to serve them better. So start this out by looking for your tribe, looking for the people that belong to you and with you in the process. Now with that, we're gonna start on a little section about operational categories. These are things that you have to think about uh, when you're trying to turn from maybe what might be a home-based hobbyist experience into something that really has to do production. So here's the four operational categories that we're going to review. Uh, the first one is machines and other equipment. Obviously, we're not doing a lot of embroidery without an embroidery machine that works for us, but we have other equipment that's going to make us more professional, make our job easier, and may help us to expand our business as we move forward with selling. Uh, the second thing, of course, is supplies and accessories, and being in the house of all supplies and accessories with the great people at Madeira USA here, we're gonna have some great tips about what you need to stock up on, and the kind of things that I see as staples when you're starting in business. Next, we're gonna talk a little about digitizing. Uh, being a digitizer myself, you might imagine I have some opinions on this, and honestly, I've helped tons of people deal with the idea of whether or not they want to have digitizing in-house or how to deal with outsourcing digitizing. We're gonna talk about tips surrounding that and what you really need as a baseline no matter what business you're in. And the last bit we're gonna talk about is marketing. And uh, this will just be about getting your head around the process of marketing. We'll talk a little bit about potential audiences that might make that easier and a little bit about channels like social media and other ways that we can increase our profile. So let's start with embroidery machines and other equipment. Uh, this is a question I get pretty frequently, especially with people who are passionate home embroiderers who wanna get into the business. Uh, is my current embroidery machine enough to get started? Um, looking at the image on the left, you can see that I'm sewing out a sample on a completely home-based embroidery machine, the cheapest kind of thing you can buy. Um, can it do nice embroidery? Well, that gradient looks pretty good to me. However, it may not be the best for production or for the tribe of people you have out there. Since you have to know your audience, you'll know the kind of things they need. You have to look at your machine's capabilities. If your tribe, the kind of people you want to sell to, really love structured hats with 3D foam on them, a home machine like this is absolutely out of the question for making those things happen. It's not going to have the kind of capabilities you need. And frankly, because of the way that they are structured, and we're going to talk a little bit about more about this the next slide that we come to, uh, they aren't really great for doing finished garments. Though you can do finished garments on them, it may take longer to do them because they aren't tubular. That flat deck makes it really hard to get material out of the way of your decoration area, making you slower. The next thing is ease of use. Uh, now this actually can go both ways. Sometimes commercial equipment can be harder to use than uh, home equipment, depending on what you, who you're talking to and what you're talking about. However, you need to look at your current equipment and say, is this going to be easy? Is this something that I can handle? Uh, is it also in the kind of condition where I know that I can trust it to run? but is this easy to use for me in my current situation? Will I, especially if you're a single proprietor doing this on your own, be able to run this thing by myself and be able to make the throughput that I need? And that takes us into this third category, throughput. Is my machine literally fast enough, capable enough, and in good enough repair that I'm going to be able to put a commercial level of production through it? Now, depending on the pieces you're creating and how much you're charging per piece, it might not be a numbers game, but for a lot of us, once we start into selling, especially you sell to teams or businesses or groups, you start having to do a little bit more throughput than most hobbyists are going to do. Uh, you have to think very strongly about whether or not the uh, speed of your machine and your abilities on that machine will allow you to do the kind of production it takes 
to make money and to have enough throughput to deliver on time. So when you're thinking about your current machine and whether or not it's enough, what is it capable of? Can it do the kind of garments I needed to do? Can it do the kind of work I need to do? Is it easy enough to use, especially in the condition of the sort of garments or items I want to sell? And what kind of throughput can I expect to actually get out of this machine on a daily basis? Now, when we're talking about machines and other equipment, we have different types of machines that people are usually getting into. And there's some considerations about each type of machine, especially for small and burgeoning shops that you might want to think about. Uh, number one, home machines, as I mentioned earlier, tend to be slow. They have flat uh, areas that you can decorate on, and they don't have cap gauges for working on finished caps. So they really have a lot of limitations. It doesn't mean that modern home machines can't do uh, attractive embroidery or decent embroidery, but they may be slower or harder to use than a, the next level up, which I'm going to call a prosumer machine. Now, when I discuss prosumer machines, it's a portmanteau of professional and consumer. What we're talking about are the multi-needle machines that are sold by or around kind of the home machine market. Uh, you'll still see these in commercial trade shows. In the picture on the left, the left-hand side is a home-style prosumer level machine that's being marketed by a commercial machine company. And this machine does have multiple needles. It allows you to do multiple color changes without rethreading. Uh, it is a little faster than a flatbed machine. However, what you're going to find with the prosumer machines, they are a little slower than a commercial machine. They may not have the same capabilities, and definitely the decoration area tends to be smaller. Uh, I have dealt with many a frustrated person who's got a home-style uh, multi-needle machine that has a very small cap area specifically. They're not tall. They don't do very tall designs and they come across difficulty trying to do the kind of work they expected to do looking at commercial cap machines. Uh, and the last kind of machine is a dyed-in-the-wool commercial machine. Uh, that's what you have on the white, uh, in the, the white machine there on the right-hand side. That is a commercial single-head machine that is absolutely in that commercial space. Uh, they are going to be a little sturdier to some degree. They generally tend to have a larger decoration area and run faster. Uh, what they don't have that the prosumer machine does have, let's say that you are not that skilled necessarily as an embroiderer or you are looking for some automation, some help, prosumer machines may have things like some computer vision to help you align things with a sticker so you'd never have things out of alignment on your garment. A prosumer machine uh, also will have hoop warnings, which will stop you from running a needle into a hoop, which let me tell you, on the most commercial machines, they absolutely do not know what hoop is on. So if you run yourself into a hoop, you'll be breaking a reciprocator and out of commission for as long as it takes to replace one. So the commercial machines may have less of some of the automation and safeties. Uh, some people refer to these as training wheels. It might not be the nicest way to put it, but the training wheels <laughs> do work. They keep you from crashing. Uh, but the commercial machine does tend to have more capabilities and be able to handle things that are a little more industrial. If you look at what we're sewing here on that right-hand side, that is 3D foam on a big structured hat. I really haven't found a home machine that does that as well as a commercial machine. So if that is one of your top garment choices, or if you need a really large sewing area, or a large complement of needles to do multicolor work, or to have a lot of multicolor needles um, threaded up so you can do quick work and have a lot of colors on your machine at all times, you may want to look at a commercial solution. So here are some other considerations about our embroidery machines. If you're buying or if you have business-capable machines, right? Whenever we're looking to buy a machine, now I'm not suggesting everybody's going to jump into a multi-head machine like you see in the picture there. That's one of the babies I ran for quite some time. Uh, however, you do have to think about these two categories no matter where you're looking to get your machine. Uh, number one, support. Number two, repair. Under support, we have two categories. Um, official support is the kind of support coming directly from the manufacturer or perhaps from the person who you're buying it from. In uh, If they're a reseller, someone who refurbishes machines, they also, in my book, are considered to be official support. Uh, if you don't have the kind of ability to contact people, the kind of training you need, if they don't have materials for you to learn how to work your machine, or if they don't have uh, support in general, whether it's call-in support, chat support, whatever that is, you need to be concerned about that from the get-go. You're going to need support if you're starting out, especially if it's a new machine class or category you've never run before. You need to be able to get some training, and if people can't afford you that, uh, that's a red flag you should absolutely look at. Even if the machine is cheap, realize that if there's a lot of limitations on support, uh, you'll be sad that you don't have that support later. Uh, certainly, community support is the other half of this and something that people don't always think about. You want there to be a vibrant community of users of this machine or machine type out there that you can contact. 
if you find that there are no people that you can find running a machine, that's usually a red flag too. Uh, you can't imagine how many people really get most of their support from the community. Though it's great to get official support, the people in the community who are actually using machines day to day are decorators and they're going to encounter the same kind of problems that you face and might be able to give you a quicker answer or a different answer than someone who's official who's going to give you technical documents. Uh, really, community support is absolutely something that I suggest everyone look at before you buy into a machine or machine brand. Second is repair. Uh, this is something especially when we talk about the difference between home machines or prosumer level machines and commercial machines that comes to kind of bite people who have never been in the commercial space. If you are not close to a place where technicians come from a hub or the business that you purchase the machine from, frequently you're going to have to pay to have a technician fly out to see you to repair your machine if there's something really wrong that you can't handle. Uh, if you can't get on what's called a service sweep uh, commonly, where say you and other people who either have your machine brand or if you're with a multi-brand uh, technician, where you guys share the cost of having someone come out to your region to check out all your machines, you end up having to deal with the entire cost of having someone flown out and having them look at your machine. Knowing those costs of what a technician uh, cost to get out to where your location is, is important, especially I've dealt with lots of folks who start businesses in rural areas, and it may be quite costly to have someone out to look at your commercial machine. It's not a reason necessarily not to get one, but it is something you should know before you start. Uh, the second part is parts availability. A lot of people like to jump in and get used machines, uh, and they don't really know that it seems like a great deal, but you end up with a lemon down the road. Uh, I have a machine that I really loved running, a single head that is no longer in production, and Every time I see one coming up for auction or someone is selling one off, I have a desperate feeling like I want to buy this thing again and relive my glory days of sampling on that machine. But the truth of the matter is when a brand is not supported anymore, there are no parts available for it. It's very difficult to repair them. And especially when we're talking about electronic parts, it can be quite costly or even impossible to do anything about them if, say, one of the boards goes out. So you have to know the parts availability, especially when you're dealing with used equipment, before you really understand what your cost of ownership is. Uh, some people will buy a used piece of equipment and uh, take the lottery gamble that I can do enough work on it to pay for the next equipment coming in before it dies, but you don't know necessarily when an older or an unserviced machine is going to pass out of the existence of stitching. So really knowing your parts availability is important. So this all comes into that total cost of ownership. And like I said, some people really stay in that prosumer machine space because they know they can take their machine to a local shop and have it maybe shipped back to the manufacturer or there's a technician at their sewing back shop that can handle some small work on the machine. There is some validity to it. And I know that some people who do, uh, especially monogramming and personalization, love those machines because they're easy to take to locations to do location or event-based embroidery, especially simple stuff. And they will do that stuff all day long on a prosumer level multi-needle. But really, you have to look at all of this stuff in a holistic way. Not only do you have to make sure you have your capabilities, but you have to look at the costs involved. So the total cost of ownership weighed against your capabilities that you need is really how you're gonna find out if you're getting that business capable machine. So with that, let's go ahead and get into additional equipment. These are things that you may need that are going to help you out with your operations from day to day. Uh, number one is tension gauges. Not everybody gets tension gauges when they first start out, and I really suggest that you do, especially if you're coming from a home-based business or a home embroidery area. A lot of people say, really, don't touch tensions. That's absolutely not the case, especially in a commercial experience. You're going to be adjusting tensions, and tensions are going to change over time. Not to mention, if you do, as we're going to talk about later, decide to use things like thin threads or you have different types of threads that you're going to do, different fibers, you're going to want to run different tensions to make those work correctly for you. So for my money, I always say get a tension gauge and have it handy because when you need to reset your tension, uh, doing it by feel might be great for veterans like me who've done this a million times, but having a number to which you can actually set your tensions, both top and bottom, are it's incredibly important for someone who's just starting out, especially if you're on equipment that you're not familiar with. Uh, admittedly, a lot of this stuff, look to the bobbin first when you're having tension problems. Don't start twiddling knobs. Admittedly, I agree that that is a good idea for those folks who say don't adjust tension. However, having tension gauges means that when you go to touch the knobs, when you go to work you know, on your tension, uh, you will absolutely be able to justify and verify that tension via a numerical 
set up. So really get your gauges, have them on hand. It's worthwhile. If you have uh, traditional tension gauges, you might need a top and bottom gauge. If you have the new digital gauges, you may be able to use one gauge for both. Uh, the second thing is a garment steamer. I really would not run a shop without a professional garment steamer with a wand. And part of the reason is that I think of finishing the process of making my garment ready for packaging or ready to be shown to a customer is actually the best kind of marketing you do in a shop. Once you have a customer in who's gotten over the initial resistance to buying from you, the next time you sell them is when they open the box and they have the experience of seeing their garment for the first time. So having a steamer allows you to handle the most common issue, which is hoop ring or hoop burns that you get from your hoop, just causing some compression in the garment. Uh, steam that out of every garment before you deliver them. If you're not making enough margin for you to take the time to steam, then your pricing is the problem, not the finishing. The other thing with the garment steamer is if you use uh, a garment steamer, you can absolutely take out water soluble topping, something else we're gonna talk about later in the most easy way. Take that steamer, roll up the excess garment uh, topping, that water soluble topping, and run the steamer over it. This topping sticks to itself and it rips all the little bits and bobs of topping out of the design itself. It's the easiest way I've ever found. Uh, the next thing are hooping aids, which we saw in the last image. Uh, hooping aids, absolutely something I didn't start with. When I first went out, all hooping was done on tables and done by hand and you had to do it by feel. Uh, Currently, I really suggest people use hooping aids because it makes you have a professional look when you can repeat your results. When you get your hoop set up, number one, if you have no experience, they can help you to find from sizes and types of garments what numbers you should use to locate your hoop. However, even if you have experience, once you've set up and you have a customer who likes where their positioning is on their garments, you can return to that positioning the next time if you notate these numbers in your design information. So hooping aids, also great for uh, magnetic hoops. If you decide to use magnetic hoops to get that awesome tension all the way around the hoop, they really snap shut in a way that is sometimes quite violent if you're not used to it. It's very quick. Having the hoop placed and positioned correctly on the bottom before you go to drop that top hoop in is absolutely critical. Uh, use a hooping station, especially if you're gonna have magnetic hoops. And the last one is a heat press. Now, I'm not talking about a press for pressing the garment here. We're talking about a uh, garment decoration heat press like you can see in the picture. Um, though you can use these for pressing or what some of my, uh, <laughs> my operators call setting embroidery, I don't think you have to do that with every embroidery, but if you wanna flatten out and set your embroidery, they work great for that. The thing is these also allow beyond that the ability to set heat press applique and that is absolutely something that if you get into team sports that you'll want to do and when you work on large pieces you may want to do just to use um, less stitch coverage. So using it for applique is fantastic, rip away applique using things like heat transfer vinyl and if as you will, if you start to do decoration especially in a general way, you're going to find people who want prints the easiest way to start printing as an embroiderer is to have a heat press on hand and order either transfers or glitter transfers or rhinestone transfers, even sublimation transfers, directly printed for you before you have to lay into any sort of equipment to make those transfers yourself. You can order those transfers and apply them to garments with just a heat press. So this is something you might not wanna start with, but if you're looking for your first expansion, I can't recommend a garment heat press enough. So supplies and accessories. Obviously, we know that we need to have supplies and accessories to get rolling. I'm going to assume a machine toolkit. Without discussing a lot about this machine toolkit, you should, at every machine, especially if you start having multiples, have everything you need to service the machine and maintain it. So you should have anything you need to change needles, to oil the machine, to do any sort of basic service, that should be at your machine, especially if you start having multiple machines or running a larger production space. So I'm going to assume your machine toolkit, and I also am going to assume that you will talk to your machine seller to find out exactly what kind of lubricants you need to have in that. But after that, we're gonna talk about the things we need for actually doing embroidery. Thread and bobbins, stabilizers, needles, hoops and jigs, and something for thread removal, because though we would love to pretend we don't, uh, we are absolutely going to embroider something incorrectly, and there are always those pieces that we absolutely cannot lose. Let's start with some thread considerations. Uh, number one, thread type. I'll be honest and say that for me, the choice has usually been polyester. Uh, if you're doing generic digitizing or decorating for people who are going to be doing business apparel. If you do uniforms and you expect that there's going to be any chance of industrial laundry or bleaching or a lot of exposure to outside elements, polyester just holds up a little bit better than rayon to those things. You can actually treat it a little rougher and have it hold up. 
Um, rayon is lovely, and especially when dealing things like home decor, I actually I started out with rayon in my career and really love rayon. Uh, the look of it, the tension of it is fantastic. However, it just doesn't hold up to the abrasion and the punishment that polyester does. So you'll see that even in this piece here, that is a set of poly neon cones that I'm working with. So when you're looking at thread type, consider where the thread is going to be used, what your tribe, your tribe of people who you're selling to needs before you decide what you're going to lay into for your stock. Trust me, you'll probably have more than one type on hand. Color range. Though you can see in this lovely gradient that uh, I am one of those people who does have a full range of colors, at least in one cone each, uh, it's fantastic to have. You don't necessarily have to start with an entire range of all the colors that are made, uh, though I'm sure that it would be lovely to have it, and it actually is when you're doing things like sampling, testing, or work for fashion. If you're doing a sampling room, you may want to have a larger color range. Um, generally, you can start out with a smaller range of your primary and secondary colors that make sense to you, and add some colors that make sense for your region or your tribe. If you're the kind of person that expects to be doing local work for schools or businesses, having the colors that are in those local schools or businesses logos and mascots makes absolute sense. Also, things for your locality. I know as a New Mexican, we have a, a lovely flag that everybody tends to really enjoy, and it's gold and red, and that means half the logos in this state are made with gold and red. If you're an embroiderer in New Mexico, you would be remiss not to have your state colors in your color range from the day one. Uh, and also remember that no matter how many machines you have, I really suggest that your color range has a cone that will fill every machine for every color because you never know when you're going to want to do a full production run on all machines. However, with that color range, I'm going to discuss briefly the other kind of colors I usually stock, and that is colors for text. No matter what, you're always going to want black, white, red, navy. Those things, and gold, are often in text, and I use those not only in standard 40 weight thread, which is what I've been discussing up to this point, but when I do specialty threads, and for me, the first kind of specialty thread is thin thread, 60 weight thread. Uh, 60 weight thread is fantastic for small lettering and fine detail work. And you don't have to lay into a full stock of that either when you start. I suggest to use what I call those lettering colors. For me and my business over years, it's always been red, black, white, gold, navy blue. Those are really, really common text colors. You may find silver or gray or other colors that come up over the years. But for me, having those on hand for text and outlining in small detail has been enough to start most people I've consulted with using 68 thread. But with specialty threads, you always have to think about uh, what those uses are when you lay into them. But once again, with all of these threads, with color range, with your thread type, with specialty threads, there are two ways of going about it. If you expect that part of the way your business is going to sell is on the speed of turnaround, or if you have a retail business, you may have to lay into a larger color range to make sure you have what people want before they come in. You have to have that stock so that you can do immediate production. However, if you're doing specialty on-order work that you expect to have some lead time, you may be able to institute a longer waiting period and buy colors as they come up in use. Now, admittedly, being in the Southwest, let me tell you that every shop I've been in has more th uh, turquoise threads than I have ever seen anywhere else by the time that you're done running them because you end up with everybody's favorite kind of turquoise one day. Uh, you're going to find that in your region there are specialty threads like this. There's nothing wrong with having multiple ways of going about stocking these. And if you have somebody who has a truly specialty thread, you can also set up that there is a fee for them to help you stock your cabinets. I know that part of the other specialty threads I often used were fire retardant threads, fire resistant threads, because we worked with electrical companies and firehouses. That's another thing where you can include that into your pricing and quoting so that you get the thread stock and they have the kind of specialty thread they need. It's all right when you're producing that extra value to pass some of that cost to the customer. Uh, last on this slide is bobbin selection. Uh, plain versus magnetic, I'll say frankly, I've used plain for most of my career and was perfectly fine with it, but I do get why people use magnetic uh, bobbins. When you are on a commercial machine with a metal bobbin case, uh, magnetic bobbins mean that you get more even tension all the way through the bobbin out to the end of the thre bobbin thread. So plain versus magnetic, that's really what it's about is having even bobbin tension throughout. Uh, lots of my friends use magnetic all the time, but you can use plain uh, cardboard sided bobbins. The thing to really think about with this is just to have enough on hand. Don't run out of bobbins. It is the worst thing ever to have less bobbins than you need. And frankly, if there's a problem on your machine, you snag up a bobbin. What you want to be able to do in production is toss that bobbin to the side and grab a new one and slap it in. You don't want to ever be running low on your bobbin selection. 
the other thing is black and white. Uh, I always stock black and white. The white is that primary choice, and everybody generally tends to have white bottom thread, especially with the drop-ins. I like to have black because, once again, that finish, the look of your garment is the first salesperson for a repeat order. I think having black bobbin, and actually later on I'll talk about black stabilizer, makes dark garments look that much more professional and clean, and it has a tendency to make the front embroidery look a little richer. So when you're using dark thread uh, or you have a dark garment, I really do like to use a black bobbin for most of that. Now stabilizer. Uh, when we're dealing with stabilizer, honestly, I come from an era where there were two types, and that's really all we ever used. It was cutaway and tearaway, and those are the core two that we used for everything. However, I would now consider the core types of stabilizer everybody should have on hand to be cutaway, tearaway, and something specific for performance wear. Uh, for me and most of my embroidery, one layer of medium cutaway has been enough. Now, that also means that I'm controlling my digitizing densities and the way that things are hooped to make that the case. However, cutaway for most garments and things that aren't thin, medium weight garments, cutaway stabilizer is going to be the way you want to go. Uh, for apparel, at least, it makes the most sense and it makes things dimensionally stable. You also hear that I don't call it backing. I call it stabilizer because it tells you what it's there to do, to make things not stretch in any one direction too much. It is stabilizer because it stabilizes the material. Um, tearaway, you definitely want tearaway on hand. Uh, number one for caps. But also tearaway is great for the things that don't need a lot of stability, but you do want to have something to aid in the stability as you're hoping. Um, certainly, like I said, primarily for caps and on both of these cases, um, generally I will use cut pieces. Pre-cuts save a lot of time in production. If you do mostly the kind of work that requires the same few sizes, which is very normal, if you're doing traditional garment work, left chest, sleeve, and back, or large designs are what you're going to do. Having that left chest level cut, that standard size cut piece just means there's one less process for you to do when you're putting together your garment. So I do like pre-cuts. But the last category here is performance wear. With the advent of performance wear and with it going nowhere, as far as I can tell, you, I'm not seeing the end of thin polyester garments or things that stretch or have wicking properties, and they often tend to be hard to keep stable. There is now a host of performance wear stabilizers you can use. For my usage, I very much like a poly mesh. A, sometimes people will call it a no-show mesh colloquially, and that just allows it to drape a little nicer while still being dimensionally stable, and it tends not to show through the front or cause uh, undue edges or stiffness after you cut away the excess. So for me, I do like a poly mesh, but really look at the available performance wear specific stabilizers because it is going to be something you need with for that very particular combination of thin, stretchy material that can show through when things drape. There's also special use stabilizers. Uh, I often make a lot of patches. If you're somebody who makes patches who's going to be edging them on an embroidery machine, you're going to need something that either tears away cleanly or is soluble, like a water-soluble stabilizer, so it can be washed away to leave clean edges. Uh, the same thing for people who are doing craft markets or who are doing things that uh, include lace. If you're doing lace work for fashion or for home deco, you definitely want to have a soluble stabilizer on hand. But that's something that really is going to be special use and depend on the tribe you're selling to. And the third thing here is a topping, which is not really a stabilizer at all. It often comes under a stabilizer category, but a topping really shouldn't be used in the same place as a water-soluble stabilizer because they're really too thin to provide stability. However, for any garment that has a sufficient amount of texture, and I actually even use them on things like a deep piquet or basket weave knit polos, having a water-soluble topping is incredibly useful to keep crispness on your design, and it does make your pieces look more professional. Uh, lastly here, let's go to needles. Uh, honestly, once again, I worked in a production consideration where we didn't do a lot about changing needles unless they were wearing out. And for us, our core type was really to stick with that 7511 when we're dealing with 40 weight thread. Uh, for us, 7511 medium ballpoint was the gold standard and stayed on our machines the most because we usually did work on knits. However, you may also have a sharp and you want to keep a 7511 sharp because a sharp needle is good for uh, woven materials and things that are coarse that require you to penetrate through the actual fiber of the garment itself. So the core types to have on hand if you're working with standard 40 weight thread, absolutely 7511 sharp and ballpoint. Like I said, I love a medium transitional ballpoint. If you mess up and use that on a woven, it is usually going to look okay. It doesn't look as fine as maybe using a sharp in the right way but that is the kind of thing that when you keep it on the machine, you know that you are usually in good stead with garment decoration. Uh, the next thing is for thick and thin threads. 
Luckily, we can actually turn to the wonderful people at Madeira because in any description of their threads or in their actual documentation, they're going to let you know exactly what needle works the best for, say, your 60 weight thread or your 75 weight thread used for incredibly fine, small detail. They're going to give you the right needle sizes to work with it, and those are worth listening to. Same thing with thick threads. You cannot be running those. You're going to get too much abrasion if you're running those through your 7511. So it makes sense to listen to those product specs and look them up. They actually are <laughs> exactly what you need to get started. So thick and thin threads, you will have to have needles on hand for those. One of my recommendations, if you have, say, a 15 needle machine, keep two, one or two needles on those thin needles so that you can do your text and fine detail in 68 thread at any time. So keep those in, on hand as well. Uh, the other recommendation on needles are stout needles for structured caps. Uh, if you have incredibly structured caps that have a lot of buckram or the, that plastic backing inside that keeps the crown structured, uh, lots of people love to run a stouter, a thicker, larger needle, or uh, even a titanium coated needle. Really, it depends on your hat. What I usually tell people, if you have a lot of trouble with needle breakage, you very much have a hat problem. Uh, great to have those stout needles on hand, and they may help with some of the deflection that comes with going through all that material but you really need to look for a hat that runs well on your machine and that embroiders well. There are some hats that are just poison on the machines. Uh, so when you have one of those, look for alternatives. However, good idea if you do caps all the time to keep some of those stout needles on hand. All right, hoops. Uh, no matter what machine you work with, I'm going to suggest that if you're going to get into business, you want to increase your throughput, you always want to start with two sets in your most common decoration sizes. This means that while something is running on your machine, you always have a hoop for any given head that you can put another garment together with. So start with two standard sets in your most common decoration sizes, especially people who are buying used machines. They often buy them without any consideration of hoops and find out that there's a tremendous amount of expense, especially with uh, multi-head machines, setting up the amount of hoops they need to actually be in production. Um, for me, the common decoration sizes I did the most were a left chest decoration, usually about a 15 centimeter hoop, and then a jacket back size decoration is going to depend on the machine and the capabilities it has, what the large hoop is for that. Um, for my machines, always had those two hoops and usually uh, sets of hoops for smaller things like working in small sleeves and uh, tubular conditions. So generally start with two standard sets of hoops in your most common sizes, no matter what machine you're working on. The next thing is to add specialty hoops and frames to fit your target market demands. If you're working on things like uh, name tapes or dog collars, there are specialty hoops and frames for that that'll make it easier than trying to futz around and make your traditional hoop work with it. It's worth it to look at these specialty hoops and frames or uh, fast frames that have adhesive backings. There's many ways to handle things like pockets or even uh, clamp frames that work on shoes. Depending on your machine, there are ways to do lots of embroidery you might not think about but it really has to be about your target market. If your target market is uh, soccer players, then looking at a shoe frame where you can throw a, a, a name on the side of a shoe ankle might be awesome, but it might not be for everybody. But one that I really love and want to kind of point out here is what's in the picture. This is the MFS, this is a Madeira system, and that's for doing badge work. Uh, I did a lot of patches, and we're going to talk about this multiple times. The reason fame is in that title up there is I did them for uh, TV shows. And the piece up there is actually for NBC's The Night Shift that you're seeing. Uh, MS frame. MFS frame like this provides a plastic substrate that you can stitch directly on for patches or applique material. And you, not only can you stitch it on, but the other frame that you see underneath it would allow you to place that frame in a garment and accurately stitch the patch or applique down to a garment in a single stage. And you can actually take out that patch and come back and bring that whole frame back in to stitch it down later. So things like that, when you have your try, when you think about your audience, which is something I'd like you to keep saying, the, the thing that I've been talking about all this time, that audience, that tribe that you need to sell to, keep thinking about that in the back of your head. If your audience has patches as a use that they're really going to want, it makes sense to have the equipment to do it efficiently and to do it in such a way that allows you the most capability you can. Uh, pieces like the MFS will make uh, especially pieces like this easier to handle. Now, stitch removal. The first note on here isn't about equipment at all. So many times when I'm dealing with decorators who are doing standard garments, they're removing stitches when really the cost of the time removing the stitch is not worth it for the garment they could be replacing. When you have standard garments that are from a, a decoration and house that you know we usually use, say that if you're buying from any of the normal suppliers and you can get one in two days and it's not a big cost, 
you really have to think about whether removing a large portion of stitches and ending up with a garment that has reduced quality from all the holes that are in it that can't be covered is worth your time. So before you start removing any stitches, think really hard. Is the garment cost worth the amount of time that I'll lose? And is it worth the uh, lower quality of the piece that I'm going to hand to my customer? So always consider whether or not removing stitches is profitable. It always feels like saving something is worthwhile at first, but frequently when you actually time yourself and find out how long it takes to remove stitches, it may not be the case. Uh, now, simple tools can be effective when you absolutely must remove stitches. Now, I'll say one of the things I've worked on several times is actually heirloom quilts. And it's a weird thing I got into for a while where I was doing quilt squares and dedications for people doing heirloom quilts. And I also did uh, for uh, native groups around here, uh, Navajo blankets. And some of these things were very expensive and or they were irreplaceable. If there was something that was an heirloom quilt, it couldn't be replaced and any damage that was done to it was going to be permanent. Um, some of these things, that makes sense to remove them. Though you can use simple tools like a razor blade to cut the stitches on the back, to cut your bobbin stitches, it's more likely to result in damage than something like a stitch eraser, which is very much like a clipper. Um, you can look into something like a stitch eraser that makes it a little less likely for you to cut the garment. Are you still have a chance to damage things? Absolutely you do. But uh, doing what I often did, which is grabbing a razor blade and just going to town on the back of the garment, um, you're a lot more likely to cut through the garment itself and cause damage that's harder to cover. So the other thing about this, you're gonna to want a set of tweezers. Removing one garment, it seems fine to pick at it with your fingernails and scrape at it, but once you end up having to do this, say for a run of garments, say you've got customer supplied garments that can't be replaced and you've managed to uh, do this to eight, 10, 12, or more of them, uh, a quality tweezer is going to be your friend. Not to mention if you're someone like me with large hands, I have a pretty good deal of fine control, but I think the older I get and the more decades of digitizing I put on these hands, the less I'm gonna be able to grab those threads. Having quality tweezers is absolutely a must. Eric, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second before sure. we start digitizing options, mostly to let you get a drink of water if you need it. <laughs> uh, we're, we are about three quarters of the way um, through our webinar. Many folks have written in saying that they're unable to download the PDF of this um, slide deck of the PowerPoint that you're looking at. Um, we're aware of that and we will be able to fix that and I just wanted to assure everybody that you'll be getting an email with a link to it that'll take you right to it. So um, if you're trying to take notes, um, for heaven's sake, stop. <laughs> just, just relax and listen and we'll be able to get you this information in two ways um, afterwards. Um, and I think that was pretty much all I needed to say. Also, for anyone who's wondering if the webinar is being recorded, it is. So if you'd like to hear it and watch it, you'll have that opportunity. If you'd like to print it out and look at it and, and take notes on it afterwards, um, that'll be possible too. So um, just wanted to let everybody know that. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, also, I definitely want to tell everybody, go ahead and look at the PDF handout that I've attached as well. Uh, everything that I'm talking about here, aside from some of the more colorful stories, will be there in a little bit more detail. So, yeah, don't take as many notes. Uh, you'll be able to look this stuff up later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with that, let's grab into uh, my favorite subject in the embroidery world, and that's digitizing. So let's talk about digitizing options. Uh, when we're talking about these options, we'll first just kind of list these out. Here are the options you have for getting the files you need. First, doing it yourself, becoming a digitizer. Uh, something that definitely isn't for everybody. I'm going to discuss the reasons why you might or might not shortly. Uh, the second is farming it out. Uh, that's something that many people do, but there are good ways and bad ways to go about it and some considerations we should certainly have in mind when we start to hire digitizing. Uh, the third is stock designs. They're definitely not for everybody, but there are some uh, categories for which stock designs make a great deal of sense. And next is keyboard lettering and personalization. Before I even get there, everybody should have lettering and personalization software if you're going to embroider. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why in a minute. First, uh, three things to consider when you're debating in-house digitizing. Number one, you don't have to be me and want to tweak stitches around day in and day out. Uh, you can be a successful embroiderer without digitizing for yourself. Some of my favorite embroiderers on earth are people who have never digitized in their entire careers, either by hiring things out or using stock designs or using standard lettering or using customizing. You can do a brisk embroidery business without ever having to touch the digitizing on your own. Uh, the next thing, you can learn to digitize while you're still outsourcing the bulk of your design work. If you do choose that you're the kind of person who wants to draw shapes and play around with densities, you absolutely can and I think should outsource your, uh, outsource your digitizing work while you're still working. Not to mention, 
not only are you getting your production done and having it stay brisk while you're learning to digitize, you can take the work of a good digitizer and analyze it, watch how it runs on the machine, analyze it in your software, and learn about the way digitizing is done, the way it functions. Outsourcing your work is absolutely okay while you're still learning to digitize. Don't expect to just flip a switch and go straight to the process of being in production. Also, at the end of this, I'll say it again, those who choose not to digitize should still learn to customize and personalize. I think everyone should have software in which they can open up a design, composite more than one design, and add text to that design easily. No matter what you do in embroidery, there will be some personalization, even if it's just adding a name or adding one line of text. Everyone should learn how to customize and personalize, and if you're excited about digitizing but don't want to go whole hog, you should probably learn to do some small amount of editing. So really, you don't have to digitize, but you can, and if you do, it's totally fine to be getting some of that digitizing done while you're still learning. Now, here are three great reasons to digitize in-house. Uh, the piece you're going to see on the left-hand side, Chambers, that is actually a piece that was done for a Netflix TV show of the same name that came out this year, and it's a piece that I did. Um, and working for people like the TV houses is one reason you'd want to have the top reason here, responsiveness. For the people who did uh, filming, and I worked in stuff that ended up in costuming for like Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and a bunch of other shows, you have to do things that are on an incredibly tight turnaround. Sometimes within eight hours, you have to go from the initial design to a finished piece. If you're doing that, that responsiveness is important to you if that's your tribe. That's a great reason to have your digitizing in-house because it allows you to answer questions quickly, to be able to do editing quickly, and to have full control in the same day immediately over your digitizing. That's a great reason to do it. So any kind of sampling that is time-based like that, great reason to bring it in-house. Second thing is creativity. If you look at that piece that's over there, um, the texture that's in that heart is made of multiple different sections with different stitch angles and different stitch types. Though it's a little flatter in the uh, slide than it looks like in real life, having that faceted piece really impressed the people when they saw their initial sample. And it's one of the reasons that I was chosen to digitize some of the fun stuff I did because I was doing something creative that might not have been done if I just sent the flat art that didn't have any notation for these different facets and shapes into a generic digitizer. Can you get creativity out of an outsourced digitizer? Absolutely, but it means you're going to have to communicate that to them and work with them, and then you don't really have any control over what way they choose to render your design. Third is control. Now, you might think I'm talking about that kind of creative control that I just discussed, but it's also control of production. We all know that the file really establishes how we're going to be able to run it. We've all used a file that not only maybe has quality issues, but might cause thread breaks in the same spot every time because we have too many short stitches in one area, or maybe it just has too many color changes. It revisits the same color over and over when it really could have uh, combined those colors into one color change. Either that or maybe it just has a tendency instead of traveling to jump around and trim too much. Those kind of things are why you might want to have control. If you really need efficiency to do the work that you want to do for your tribe, then having that control is a good reason why to take that digitizing in-house. But there's one terrible reason that I hear over and over to bring your digitizing in-house, and that's to save money. If the reason why you want to digitize is to quit paying your outsourced digitizer for files, trust me, that's probably not a good reason to do it. You're going to lay into some fairly expensive software, even if you go with more reasonable software, it's going to be an initial outlay. You won't be able to turn and switch and immediately do all of your digitizing yourself, so there's going to be an overlap period. And the likelihood that you're going to go less, especially than overseas digitizers, um, you're not probably going to be able to do with your time what they do for the amount of money you pay. So saving money usually isn't the best reason to digitize in-house. However, if you want to be responsive, you want to be creative, do something different that other people don't do, and you want to have control, those are great reasons to consider digitizing yourself. Now, three things to remember when you're outsourcing digitizing. Though I did discuss overseas digitizers, what I'm going to say is not getting one cheap. <laughs> that, that's not the best reason to do it. Getting the cheapest digitizer may not be your best option. You want to balance your costs because not all costs are out of pocket. Just because the file is cheap doesn't mean it's not costing you. If you find that the quality isn't ideal, that the customers aren't as happy with the quality they get, or that you can tell that this quality isn't as professional as you like it to be, or if it has any of those production problems I discussed in the earlier slide, it's very much well worth it to have a digitizer that is aware of how embroidery works, who stitches real samples, 
and who can handle production requests and requests that are about changes quickly. If you can't get that from your chief digitizer, it's worth looking for someone who costs more but who is more responsive and able to uh, accommodate your request. And the second part of that, like I said, establishing clear lines of communication. One of the reasons why it's not great to always get the cheapest digitizer is you may find it difficult to get a hold of them or you can't communicate with them in the scale that you need to for your business. If you're doing quick turnarounds but you aren't ready to move digitizing in-house, you have to have a digitizer who can answer that quickly and sometimes if it's someone who does charge for edits or charges more to get things done, it's worthwhile if that's going to keep your business running smoothly. Uh, lastly, you might want to look for a working file where it's possible. If you look at the picture on the left, on the full, farthest left-hand side, you'll see that that's an object, that's a satin stitch object in a working file. A working file is the file that the digitizer works in themselves. That file has a vector-like shape that when it's resized, the software can repopulate with stitches according to the settings that they demanded. What that means is it can essentially keep the same density, keep the same stitch angles as the original. On the right hand side is a stitch file, the kind of file that the machine understands. We all know that if we resize a stitch file, if we don't have software that can process stitches, it means that going larger uh, reduces density, going smaller increases density. And with small details or with overly large satin stitches, you may find that you're either going too large or too small by doing any resizing at all, even if the density change doesn't cause you problems. So, Unless you have software that processes stitches very well, you can't do a lot of resizing and you definitely can't do editing on a stitch file. So if you can get somebody who will provide you a working file and you can match your software to theirs, it's a little bit more control that you can get out of your outsourced digitizer. Uh, last thing here, stock designs. Four things to remember about stock designs. In my career, didn't really use very many because most of my work for it was done business to business. They're not that tremendously useful for business to business because most business to business work will be logo work. So even if you have some supplementary stuff you do for an event that uses a stock design, you'll find that people try and sell you large collections of stock design as a business tool. Um, unless you're in particular markets, it really isn't necessarily the top thing that you need. Uh, second thing, these are usually stitch files like I talked about earlier. They must be kept roughly at the original finished size. So if you find somebody you hand them a catalog or send them to a website to look at stock designs and they pick something and it's uh, wildly a different size than what can be stitched, especially working on hats. Um, these things are not usually sequenced for hats and they might not be sized for hats and you may not be able to find a size in that stock design. Really reduces the amount of usefulness they have. Uh, third thing is, if you are going to use them for something, combine them with customization. Definitely have the ability to place multiple designs together, to move, rotate, shape designs, and to add text to them. Uh, you absolutely don't want to work directly just out of stock with no other ability in-house to do customization. But they do match some markets. Number one, gift markets. If someone's coming in and selecting something and selecting a design to put on it uh, in a retail style space, absolutely they're not coming in with art, uh, at least not in the primary sense. These people are probably going to want to select from stock designs. If you're doing that kind of work, that makes sense to have a nice stock design collection or access to, to buy stock designs in-house. Uh, the second thing is outdoors market. The 10 times I can count on, on both hands that I use stock designs are because I actually got tired of working in the art, outdoors market and I said to my uh, employers, I'm not making one more bugling elk, not for nothing. Uh, so the outdoors market is one where people come in and just say, I want an elk, I want a rainbow trout. Uh, when they say that, they don't usually have a photograph and they're not looking to pay digitizing costs to get things done. The outdoors market, stuff like that, great to have stock designs on hand for that. Uh, and the next one, sports and clubs. Uh, sports and clubs frequently are going to say, I just need this text above and below X sports equipment or ball. Obviously, you're going to want to have that, and especially for independent clubs, they may not have logos. Though you still may be doing mascot work or certain kinds of text work that are specific to those groups. You may still have to have things hired out for digitizing. I find that uh, stock designs really do play a part there. And the last one that's not listed here is if you're doing craft shows, um, designs with sayings and cute stock are often being used at craft shows and things like that. So looking for something that is delightful, that kind of causes somebody to stop, that is entertaining or funny, those are useful in that category. But if you're going for business to business decorating stock designs, it's not really a big selling point if someone tells you we have a ton of stock designs to sell you. Uh, unless you're mar marketing to these kind of groups I told you, um, business to business, having a large category of stock will probably not be a, that much of an asset. Uh, last thing, customization, customization, keyboard lettering. 
absolutely you must have this in my opinion if you think you're going to digitize or not digitize even but you want to do any sort of embroidery this is just necessary uh, composition you want to be able to move a design in the hoop somewhere where you need it or put two designs together and have them be composed the way you want them everybody should have that software second thing name drops Embroidery, the classic use of embroidery is always to have put names on a garment, especially if you're doing something like later, you see their team naming or uniforms. Absolutely, you need to be having keyboard lettering. What I mean by keyboard lettering is that you're not dragging individual letters into a compositing uh, piece of software and having that set up your names. You have something that you can type in, whether it is object-based keyboard lettering or stitch-based keyboard lettering that's locked to one size. Either of those is fine as long as it matches the uses your customers are going to need. You just want to make sure that's something you can type in. Now, if you are doing a ton of teamwork, it does make sense to look for software that may have team naming options. So you can import a list and be able to have that list generate a set of name designs directly. That is something to look for if you do team naming constantly. If that's your primary market or possibly uniforming, definitely something to look at doing. And the last one here is monogramming. The funny thing I find with that is sometimes I talk about monogramming and depending on the region I'm on, it's either nothing or the only thing. So I would suggest everybody look into that. If it's something that's in your market, in your region, especially if you're doing gifts or retail work, um, monogramming is absolutely a real thing. Find software that does decent monogramming and have that on hand. It is a great way to have a very simple, uh, quick to run design choice uh, to sell to your customers. And last section, we're going to go through marketing. And I really know some people have really been holding on for this one. I'm going to try and get people over the hoop who are not used to selling. You want to get over that initial hump, that resistance that comes with selling. Uh, and to that end, I've shown you a really goofy picture of me that looks like I'm trying to eat this guy's head. Uh, yeah, he's actually selling me a machine. I'm not selling him anything. But there is a point to the reason I put this on here. Uh, selling doesn't have to be a dirty word, and it can be fun, and you can be having a fun time like I am here. If you are recommending a product that you really believe in and you are talking about something you are passionate about, there's no reason why this has to be the classic model of the used car salesman. You're not trying to pawn something off on someone that they don't want. You're trying to recommend a product the value of which you believe in strongly to someone who you think really can use it. You're providing solutions to someone who you care about that result for them. So selling doesn't have to be a dirty word. Think of it more like consulting. You want to help somebody and show them a product that you think is really going to be beneficial to them. If you don't believe that your product is beneficial or has value, work on your product until you do. The second part is telling the story. Whether we're in social media talking about our business or we're talking to someone about something we're trying to sell, you don't just want to talk about the capabilities. You don't just want to say, I put a design on a thing. You want to tell them the story of what their life will be like when they have the thing you are selling. What is it useful for? How will it make people feel? What can it be attached to emotionally for them that makes life better? And I know that sounds like such a large thing to say, but I can tell people I make shirts for family reunions, or I can t tell people I make you feel like you really belong to something and you have this beautiful memento of the time you spent with your family. I said the same thing there, but the second one sounds a lot more attractive than the first. Whether you're talking about yourself in your shop or you're talking about your product, make sure you're telling the story that connects it to people's experiences. And the third thing, marketing is never done. You are never done selling, so get used to it now that you'll be selling and recommending and out there putting yourself in that space as long as you're running a business. If it's something you absolutely hate, it's great to partner with somebody who does, does it better than you do. However, I think working with this in certain ways that we're going to discuss will help you realize that it doesn't have to be this, like I said, used car salesman uh, mode that we think selling comes from. You can do it in a way that is passionate and respectful and that actually is looking to increase people's happiness and make their lives better. There are some potential starter audiences here, uh, and we'll just discuss these very briefly and go in a little bit more about the methods afterwards. The first thing, personal interests, I really suggest that everybody look into things you already belong to, communities you belong to, your niche marketing starts here. Uh, personal interests, clubs you belong to, uh, things that you like to do, hobbies that you're into are a great way for you to start because you already know the audience, you already know the tribe, and you belong. Uh, the second thing is local businesses. I've known several people who start trying to sell by going directly to these really large national companies and trying to sell to them or selling to one franchisee in their local region. 
frequently you'll find that they have commissaries or some other way that they're being supplied with garments at a price you may not be able to match, especially if you're a small shop. Working directly toward those national groups probably isn't your first step if you're just getting out there. So local businesses, businesses that are, are have that locality and are usually single or a couple different locations but are in your town, in your area, might be the best way for you to go. And being a local business yourself, part of the edge may be that you can say you got local business, that they got their work from a local business and share the um, promotion between each other because you can talk about their business while you talk about their garments. Uh, the third thing, school, schools and sports clubs. I cannot tell you how many embroiderers I have seen who are in larger shops now who started because they were decorating for a school that their kid belonged to, a sport that their kid belonged to, or some club that they belonged to earlier. That is a great way to start because you have built-in connections that can help you to share. Not to mention, schools and sports clubs, I also can't tell you how many times I've had a larger business come to me because one of the people I decorated for in a sports club happens to belong to the larger business and knows the purchasing agent and loved the finish of the piece I created. So schools and sports clubs, local businesses, and definitely personal interests and hobbies. Personal interests and the schools and sports clubs may bloom out into larger work down the road. Now, this is my method for getting people started in marketing, and it's something that I did myself. I'm actually going to tell a personal story here to make this clear. Uh, I like to have people start with a niche, and in this case, the niche is a personal hobby or interest or a group that you belong to yourself. What you're going to be seeing on the left-hand side is a tote bag, and it is actually the first time I ever worked in e-commerce. This is the store that I set up. These were tote bags for folk musicians, and what is on that tote bag is the instrument I used to play. I played to the point where I actually went to shows and played a couple of gigs on stage, and that is a mountain dulcimer, a weird folk instrument from Appalachia that uh, not many people knew what it was. However, I was in a community of people who knew what it was, and I had deep knowledge of it myself. And what you can see there in that bag is a gar is a piece that I knew they would really love. It was a bag with a gusset that would stand up next to your chair while you were playing and that fit music books very readily. So I had the knowledge of the garment they would like and then the design they liked. So like I say in the, t in the first uh, bullet point here, the deep knowledge of your hobby or your interest means that you already know your audience. You know what they need and you know what they're going to like whether it comes to the garment or the accessory or the design that you produce. The other thing you'll see underneath the design there is this uh, phonetic pronunciation of the word dulcimer. Why? Because the instruments we all played were weird and we all knew that half of what we would do if we set up somewhere to play or if we were hired to play for a, a coffee shop or some event is that we would just be handling people walking up and saying, hey, what's that? And that was half your day. So the joke, the inside joke for us, despite the fact that we love this kind of classic look of this piece, was that nobody knows what it is and here's a way for you to learn how to pronounce the weird name of this weird instrument that I'm playing. Uh, the second part of this niche is that you're involved in a community. We have connections and social proof. So once you're involved in this community, people know who you are, they know that you speak the way they do, that you know what's going on, and if they've seen you in the community, whether this is a local charity, a school, or an interest, like I'm talking about a hobby, the people in your initial local community will actually know who you are and you have that social proof. Not to mention, once someone starts to buy from you and they share, they actually can show other people, hey, here's this insider, somebody who we trust, who's also a player, who's also someone who is interested in things we're interested in, who is making these garments. Now we can go to one of us to get this source. And you're speaking the language, like I say in the third part. You have that insider status. When you talk to them, you have experiences that they understand. All of these things make this a great way to start marketing because you don't have to get over this initial hump of what do we have to talk about? How can I approach them? You know what they want. You know the kind of images that they'll like to see. And as you can see here, this is a whole set of the initial samples I did. And I actually used this. Uh, I made a sample quilt at one point that we hung up in a local instrument shop. And I did instrument sales there. And we did sales online. And it expanded online because this community would then share online pictures of their work, pictures of them using these bags. So the, speaking a language, that insider status, knowing the information, I knew what kind of uh, what kinds of instruments fell into this category and what kind of aesthetic people would like. So here's one of my dulcimers with all those samples and you can see being the person who knew that gave me insider status and that whole thing about social proof I said earlier, when someone buys from you and they share with someone else, they're saying I trust this person and it's the best kind of proof you can have for, for someone who hasn't bought from you before. That's why I always suggest starting with a niche, 
starting with a group you belong to, no matter what kind of group that is, because it really gives you this initial sense of things that other people have to do as market research will already be ingrained in you when you start. And here's some channels people always talk about. Um, you're always looking for where do I start doing this marketing? Certainly, social media is great. But the first thing to notice about social media is the word social. It has to be a social experience. That's why we're here for it. It can't just be another channel by which you throw out advertising. So the first thing is everybody tells me, okay, I want to do social media. Where should I go first? Well, obviously, you're going to have to go where your tribe spends time. You're going to have to know the people you're looking for and know where they're headed. Um, Facebook is always a great place to start. Yes, it is aging out a little bit more than it used to be, but there's so much of the human population there, and there are so many subgroupings that are for specific niches that you can address um, that going to Facebook is a good bet. But I know, if you look on the left-hand side there, those are a few pictures from my own Instagram. Rather than embarrass somebody else and show their pictures or have to show their shop, I decided to show some of my Instagram pictures here. Um, Instagram is an awesome visual medium. And so Instagram is a great place to go, and it skews a little bit younger. And trust me, there are tons of other places to go. We can go to Twitter. Heck, I know people who are working even on TikTok. They're doing videos about what they do in their shops. Any one of these channels is viable so long as the people who you want to sell to are spending their time there. Once you get there, definitely, like I said, visual media is king. You want to have pictures. You want to have video. What we do is a very visual thing. We're about creating images and decorating. Get out there. Share your story in a visual way. You have to show them you're human, and you have to show the kind of work you want to do. And to do that, you want to tell your story and engage. Do tell the story of your shop. Be human, be real, and be vulnerable out there. Tell them what you do. Show them what you do. And show them a little bit about the culture of your shop and what you believe in. You want to also engage. You're going to have to talk to people directly. This is something that you're not actually going to engage in if you're going to throw out an advertisement and then step away and not answer questions, and you're not going to check it regularly. You're better off not being in social media at all. If you're not going to engage, don't participate because looking like you're not engaged looks like your company is not active. Looking inactive makes it look like you're either not plugged in or that you're not actually really active as a company, and that can happen to people. You start a feed and then disappear from it. It makes people wonder whether you're operating at all. And the last thing here, I threw an asterisk on it because this is the thing that's going to cost you money, targeted marketing. Um, social media is awesome, especially Facebook, Instagram, because you can do incredibly hyper-targeted marketing where when you start putting money toward marketing a post or marketing an ad or an event, you can actually say, here is a locality down to the town that I want to address. I want them to have these two things listed as interests. I want people in this particular age group to see this. And then you're limited only by the amount of money you can put in as to how many people it gets in front of. The incredible ability to target marketing is very unique to social media. And though search and other kinds of marketing are useful, I find that social media has a great deal of uh, benefit, especially if someone can get a hold of this concept of telling their story, engaging, and being consistent with putting content out there that entertains people, that brings them in. If it's always advertising, if it's always sales, people are going to look at you the way they look at flyers in the mail. They're not going to listen. If you bring things in that are entertaining and engaging, that make people want to stop, think about the things that you stop on when you scroll, and that's the kind of stuff you want to produce. It has to be content, not just advertising. So. Tell your story and engage when you get there on social media and be where your people are. The next thing, honestly, are some really classic ways of getting involved in your local community. Uh, community participation. There's nothing, nothing like joining a community event and sponsoring, either sponsoring an event yourself or doing things like sponsoring an item for a contest or a raffle or a giveaway. Uh, with the proviso that you make sure that your contact information is really connected to that. You want to make sure that they have your contact information on everything and you're allowed to do that marketing. But it's really great to engage in these things, plus having a purpose, supporting something that people support. Uh, it really does lend a little more social proof because people who support that same event will want to go to you instead of someone else who is not in their tribe. So definitely think about sponsorship and contest as another potential point. But really, this all comes down to the top kind of marketing for anyone, especially we're talking about local decorators and not just an online or retail seller. Uh, with decorators who do custom work, word of mouth and referrals are still going to be a major place where you get what you need. Now, these can come from anywhere because I consider social sharing and reviews to be a certain kind of word of mouth referral here. But the thing I want to make sure everybody's clear on is that the ask is a must. When you have a happy customer, 
definitely ask them to refer you. You want them to talk about you, and it's okay for you to say, you know, you really enjoy that. You know what? Especially if somebody says, oh, that's so great. Thank you. You know what? Best way you can thank me is to tell your friends. That's all it has to be. If you can get past that initial hump of the ask, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to do that. And somebody says, yeah, I will. Now, is this going to always result in a referral? Absolutely not. But when you continue to do the ask and you make it a part of your business, and when you're doing things like packaging, throw in information. When you're packaging something up, throw in a business card and a personal note and ask for that referral. You'd be surprised how many people really want to help and support you if you're doing good by them. Well, <laughs> we went exactly an hour and 15 minutes. Eric, thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. That was extremely comprehensive as well as um, inspiring, I think. And I believe that you touched on so many elements that should be considered by embroiders who are looking to either go pro or, or simply expand. Um, I, I'm going to just kind of run through the things that you're looking at here. Uh, Madeira USA would like to offer a 10% um, discount on your next order to thank you for staying with us uh, for as long as you have. And Brilliance is a company that Eric is associated with, and they have also um, given you a, a special. And then you see at the bottom left uh, information about Eric on the first slide, which many of you will probably be downloading. There were at least after the social media mention that, that Eric shared with us, six ways of, of reaching out to him. Um, again, this webinar has been recorded um, for people that want to watch it or check in again. Uh, printable version of the PowerPoint slides is available even though uh, we didn't want to go in and try to uh, repair whatever was not working in the middle of the webinar. We will when it's over, so that will be available to you. Um, Eric has created a, a really extensive handout. It's between, I think, six and seven pages. And as he mentioned, he does go into even finer detail into some of these bulleted points that he's talked to today. So I would encourage you to download that as well. Uh, we put out there as another handout a brochure of supply packs, which include all sorts of supplies and thread collections um, for a kind of cost, uh, cost effective way for expanding your inventory. Uh, the specials that you see here and um, everything that I just mentioned will be emailed to you later today. There'll be links to each thing individually as well as to a page that will include everything so that you'll be able to um, keep whatever you'd like. And again, um, in lieu of questions and answers, Eric has very graciously agreed to answer questions. Uh, there was one that came through specifically about pricing, which I think might have been the only thing that, that we didn't cover. And it's kind of a, a specialized portion of this topic. So if anyone has a question that they feel needs a little bit more uh, depth or you need a little more understanding about it, please don't hesitate to contact Eric directly. If it's a product related um, inquiry, Madeira USA would be happy to help you. Um, I'd like to thank all of you who are left for the time that you've spent with us today. Eric, thank you so, so much for sharing all this knowledge with us um, and thank you all. Thank you all.